So this is a different type of uh, bleeding pattern. This is intraventricular hemorrhage. So here we see the ventricles, which should be nice and dark, are actually bright and they're filled with blood. So I just wanted to make one distinction here. This was something that um, I remember my chief resident would really harp on because it, it kind of takes you down two different pathways. So I'll explain this. This here we refer to as a subarachnoid hemorrhage where you know, some small vessels within the subarachnoid space were injured in a trauma and have bled. This pattern of bleeding is also in the subarachnoid space, but you can see that it's much more extensive. And we would call this on the left, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. The one on the right, we would call concerning for aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. So traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, this blood usually will be washed out over time, really not a significant thing. Subarachnoid hemorrhage though is much more significant. So I think when I would call my chief, you know, in the middle of the night and say we have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, he immediately wanted to know, is it the type that nothing to do or the type that something needs to be done? So in the aneurysmal one, you would have to get a, a CTA to look for an abnormal blood vessel that could explain this, this diffuse pattern of bleeding in the subarachnoid space. So just something to think about when you guys are, are interns. This is just a slide to kind of summarize the different patterns of bleeding that we talked about. So intraparenchymal hemorrhage, intraventricular hemorrhage, and traumatic subarachnoid blood. Now, the, one of the treatments, or one of the times when we do this procedure, it's called an external ventricular drain, is when there's intraventricular blood. You can imagine that some of these blood products will um, either from a, you know, physically block off the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, or as a product, product, the blood products break down, they could basically, uh, as they're absorbed, they could scar some of the arachnoid granulations, which are used to absorb CSF, and it could lead to hydrocephalus, so which hydro water, cephalus brain, condition of, of water on the brain. So the treatment for this is placement of an external ventricular drain. And this is something that you can do, you know, as an, your intern year at the bedside. We use different anatomical landmarks to help guide where to place the incision and um, how to place the actual catheter. But the idea is you make a small incision in the skin in the right frontal area. We choose the right frontal area because most people, even left-handed people, have language on the left side. And if you say frontal, you know, ahead of the coronal suture, you stay away from the motor strip. So we have to make a small opening in the skull, you make it open in the dura, and then you pass your catheter into the ventricle. It's tunneled out under the skin and attached to this drainage bag at the bedside. And the nice thing about this is that you really have complete control over the patient's cerebrospinal fluid. You're able to drop the bag lower than the level of the head, and you can drain more fluid. And these are usually centered over the level of the tragus. All right, so something you'll very, get very familiar with. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.